Good afternoon. Welcome to In the Trenches with DAC. Today's topic I'm going to focus on is a very basic topic, anemia. I am going to go over an approach to anemia. There are hundreds of causes of anemia, and when you're presented with a patient who has anemia, especially for the first time when you don't know what the cause is, you need an approach to this. A few weeks ago, I gave a quick talk, talk on hemolytic anemia, which was more specialized. This is going to go into just the basics of anemia. But I start with this, I learned this as an intern, there's a mnemonic, CRIPS, C-R-I-P-P-S. C is CBC, R is retic count, I is indices, P is peripheral smear, P is platelet count, and S is stool. This is a way to start. So really when you're talking about anemia, there are three major mechanisms of anemia. You have a bone marrow problem, you're bleeding, or you're hemolyzing. All anemia falls into these three categories. Now you could have multiple mechanisms. You bleed enough, you're going to be iron deficient, and it will affect your bone marrow. You hemolyze enough, you could become iron deficient and potentially folate deficient, and that could affect your bone marrow. So with the reticulocyte count, it's going to be increased with bleeding and increased with hemolysis, and it'll be decreased with a bone marrow problem. Okay, however, you have to correct the reticulocyte count to the hemoglobin. The normal reticulocyte count is 0.5 to 1.5% of red cells, about 1%. Now, if a patient has a hemoglobin of 6, and a retic count of 2.5, that's not normal. There's something going on with the bone marrow. The indices are the most important. I will get to them in a second. A peripheral smear in a perfect world would be good to examine in a patient with anemia because it could give you clues as to what's going on in their bone marrow. That's in a perfect world, and in the olden days, when I was a resident, we were able to do that. Now, because of technicalities and the ER and, and other things, it's very hard for health staff to do this. But it's still, if you can, it's important to do that. Platelet count's going to come with the CBC, that's just in the mnemonic. And theoretically, you're going to check the stool for blood to make sure the patient's not bleeding. All right, so let's go on to indices. So you could have a decreased MCV, an increased MCV, or a normal MCV. So with a decreased MCV, here's the way I'd like to approach this. You think of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin equals heme plus globin. Heme equals iron plus porphyrin, plus globin. And that's what hemoglobin is. So if you have a problem with iron deficiency, you're going to have a low MCV. If you're going to have a problem with the globin chain production, that's thalassemia. With porphyrin production, that's sideroblastic anemia, which may or may not cause a low MCV, and that comes under the category of myelodysplastic syndromes. Lead poisoning could also do this, and with that the MCVs tend to be lower. The other condition that could do this is anemia chronic disease. Now, with anemia chronic disease, the MCV is usually normal or low normal, and if it's low, it's not super low. I mean, maybe you have an MCV is 77, 78. So let's talk about these entities. Okay, iron deficiency is self-explanatory. Really, the best test for that is a ferritin. If your ferritin is low, there's nothing else that does this. If somebody has iron deficiency, you need to figure out the cause. If it's a young woman who menstruates heavily, then that's the cause. Beyond that, they need to be evaluated, especially in an older person. You need to start with the GI tract. Specifically, you need to start with a colonoscopy. Specifically, you need to look at the right side of the colon, but you need to do that. Probably an upper endoscopy. And if you can't find the cause, then maybe capsule endoscopy and to evaluate for celiac, uh, celiac disease. Celiac disease 
could cause iron deficiency, and helicobacter could also do that in the absence of an ulcer. Those are things to think about. The clue with thalassemia is they could have a low hemoglobin, but they have a normal red cell count and normal RDW. So you have a lot of small cells, and they're all the same size, but the red count is not, is not, is not low. It's high or normal. And you have to check the ethnic group, whether it's alpha thal or beta thal. If you're worried about beta thal, you're going to check a hemoglobin F and A2 level. Alpha thal could be trickier to diagnose. Sideroblastic anemia is unusual, and especially in the low MCV, but it's on the list. Let me talk about anemia chronic disease. The anemia chronic disease is there with a lot of causes of anemia. The mechanism involves hepcidin. This was discovered about 15 years ago, made by the livers, produces interleukin-6, and it prevents uh, macrophages in the reticular endothelial cell from releasing iron and letting it go to the bone marrow to make red cells. It's a teleologic mechanism, okay? And by that, what I mean is that before they had antibiotics, this was a way the body could starve bacteria for iron and cause people to survive. The thing with anemia chronic disease, and I think I'm going to take advantage of a chair here, hopefully you can see me. In order to say somebody has anemia chronic disease, they need a chronic disease. Understand that. Okay, they could have cancer, or they could have a chronic infection like endocarditis or osteomyelitis. They could have an inflammatory connective tissue disease, but they have to have anemia chronic disease. So you're rounding on a patient, patient's anemic, you ask the resident, why does this patient have anemia? Oh, well, they have anemia chronic disease. What's the chronic disease? All right, that's not sufficient. So the pearl here is, in, normal to ha in order to have anemia, chronic disease, friends, you need a chronic disease. All right, let's move on to the increased MCV. Okay, somebody has an increased MCV, the first test you're going to get is a retic count, not a B12 or a A. The MCV is the average of all the red cells. And if you have a lot of retics due to hemolysis, you're going to have a high MCV. You have a lot of retics due to bleeding, you're going to have a high MCV. So the first thing you do is get a retic count. If the retic count is low, then you think of the megaloblastic anemia, specifically B12 deficiency. Uh, you can see folate deficiency. This is unusual now. All the foods fortified with folate. It's unusual. It's unusual to do, see that. You know, it's drawn, but it's unusual. And if you're worried about B12, Deficiency. You should also get a methylmalonic acid. Um, sometimes you can see a slightly high MCV with myelodysplastic syndromes. The medicine hydrea could do this. Once in a while you can see it with hypothyroidism. And the other thing is alcohol. People who drink a lot, they could have a high MCV, you know, even if their hemoglobin is normal. And that could be uh, a way to assess that the patient uh, maybe is drinking too much. Now, if the MCV is high, you need to think of hemolytic anemia. I talked about that before. So do this quickly. You can divide the hemolytic anemia into congenital versus acquired. If it's congenital, think of sickle cell, hereditary spherocytosis, G6PD deficient. If it's acquired, you break it into immune and non-immune. Basic points, immune-mediated hemolytic anemia and the peripheral smear, you see a microspherocyte. Looks like this. You lose the central power. Okay, and if it's non-immune, it's usually a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and here you see a schistocyte fragmented cells. Without going into detail, the causes here would be the thrombotic microangiopathies, TTP, hemolytic uremic syndrome, DIC. You can see it with uh, malignant hypertension, scleroderma, heart valve hemolysis. The immune causes, 
idiopathic warm agglutinin disease, idiopathic cold agglutinin disease, and sometimes with lymphoproliferative and connective tissue diseases. You also could see immune-mediated hemolytic anemia. Now let's go where this is really tricky. Okay, most patients, they have a normal MCV. So you have a patient who's anemic and they have a normal MCV, and what are you going to do? So obviously you have to do a good history and physical and, you know, make sure they're not on chemotherapy or anything. You want to check the renal function. If they have chronic kidney disease and their hemoglobin is low, it's due to that. Um, the things you really have to think of here, it could be early microcytic or early macrocytic or mixed picture. Myelodysplastic syndromes, especially in the elderly, refractory anemia, refractory anemia with ring sitter blast, refractory anemia with excess blast. These are conditions where you have a hypercellular marrow and peripheral cytopenias, a subset could go to acute leukemias. These you see, especially in the elderly. Sometimes you can see it in the young. And also anemia, chronic disease. There's, beyond that, a whole other slew of causes of anemia. In the right setting, multiple myeloma, you need to think about that. And with that, you often think of CRAB, uh, calcium renal anemia, and bone lesions. Um, you could have anything infiltrating the bone marrow. Sometimes you could see this with myeloproliferative syndromes, myeloproliferative neoplasm. These patients are all going to have a big spleen. Um, it could be early bleeding. Um, it could be aplastic anemia. There's so many things that could cause that. And in this type of situation, if you're not sure, and it's not iron deficiency or megaloblastic anemia and blood work's not giving you an answer, at this point in time, you have to think of getting a bone marrow to ascertain the cause. Obviously, you want to make sure there are no medications that would cause this. Um, somebody's drinking a lot of alcohol, that could potentially suppress the bone marrow. So always a good history and physical you start out with. Then you need an approach. I like using mnemonic crypts, but really the most important thing there are the indices and the tick count. That'll tell you what way to go. To randomly, in every anemic patient, check iron studies, full A and B12. That's really not cost effective. You have to think a little more. Um, if you can, look at a blood smear, because that will really give you clues. You may not be able to, but it's still a very, very helpful thing. You need to make sure the patient doesn't have an occult bleed. And with that, I'm going to sign off for In the Trenches. Good afternoon.